supposed to protect and serve, not assault and charge. Tonight, Chief Alan Adams speaks out on his arrest by the RCMP. That's why we're calling for an independent, transparent investigation that will uh, get the answers that so many questions that people are asking right now. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau responds to the criticism. There was no force or um, an overwhelming, um, I think, demand by the public to have answers for this case that we wouldn't have released this video. And more police caught on camera, this time in Winnipeg. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Uh, APT News has obtained that RCMP dash cam video showing the confrontation between officers and Athabasca Chippewa First Nation Chief Alan Adam. APTN's Chris Stewart spoke to Chief Adam about his experience last night and what, how he wants policing changed. Chief Adam, thank you very much for doing this. Yep. So I'll start at the beginning. Can you run down what happened that night? My wife and I uh, walked out of the casino, made our way to the vehicle, and upon going to the vehicle, uh, my wife noticed that the RCMP was had the vehicle staked out and everything, and when I went outside to remove the uh, baby seat from the vehicle, uh, then I got it out, and the cop was parked behind the truck, and I went to the RCMP, identified myself, told him I was Alan Adam, chief of ACFN, I told him, what are you doing? And he basically said, uh, we're investigating uh, expired license plate. I don't need to talk to you. Get out of here and get back to it. So I turned around and went walking back to the truck, sat inside the truck and told my wife, I said, just investigating uh, expired license plate. She said, what? And she put the vehicle in drive and she was going to drive out and the cop came knocking on the window told her to roll down the window. When she rolled down the window, she, he yelled out, this truck's not moving, it got license expired, reached inside, put the handle, his hand on the handle and put it in park, shut the vehicle off, and within five seconds, uh, the heated discussion between my wife and the RCMP uh, was already heated and uh, there was no turning back from there. And as I watched and I seen him and stuff like that, you know, he, he reached in to grab my wife and I told him, hey, take your hand. You know, take a hand off her and I got out and I asked him, I went around the other side and I asked him, why are you doing this? And basically he said he was doing what he was doing and uh, I just stood there and watched what he did to my wife and, you know, he um, pretty much put his hands on my wife, slammed her up the trench of truck and next thing you know, we were... <laughs> I went out of the vehicle again to help my wife again, and next thing you know, there was all kinds of RCMP coming from all over the place. So I went walking around the vehicle, cop grabbed me by the arm, and we were going to make our way back to the panel, and when I looked up, I got bridged right across the cheek here from uh, this first first officer on the scene that arrived when the uh, officer was asking for a backup. And from there, I just dropped to my knees and fell to the ground. And all I heard, all I felt that there was something hitting me and stuff like that. But I don't, you know, and I was gasping for air. What needs to be done by the police to stop this type of racism going on? They have to overhaul their system. Uh, system systemic racism within the RCMP go back 150 years since they were formed. Uh, you know, and it's deep-rooted that much. And when you hear the commissioner of Alberta, second commander of commissioner, come out and say that there is no systemic uh, racism within the RCMP, they don't even realize and they don't even recognize it anymore. It's part of their day-to-day -day life that it's forgotten. But it is deep-rooted so bad that uh, it's part of their norm. Do you know what they can do to fix the problem? Uh, there should be criteria that they have to follow special guidelines because you understand that either being an RCMP or a policeman is grueling, it's rigorous, it's, you know, there's decisions to be made, it becomes personal. They have to overcome all that, and those are the kind of questionnaires that have to be answered when they go for an interview to find out what kind of level of expertise they have when they bring to the table that they want to join the police force, because the police force is supposed to protect and serve, not assault and charge. Chief, thank you for your time. Thank you. 
That video was the talk of Parliament Hill today. APTN's Todd Lamoran begins with Prime Minister, who was repeatedly asked about the Adam video. Bonjour à tous. Justin Trudeau called the images shocking and said he had serious questions about what took place. About what exactly happened, about how it happened this way, and about uh, that use of force that we saw. That's why we're calling for an independent, transparent investigation that will uh, get the answers that so many questions that people are asking right now. For the second day in a row, the Prime Minister was asked about RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky. Earlier this week, she said she's struggling over whether systemic racism is an issue in the RCMP. So Trudeau was asked if she's the right person to reform the force. And I continue to have confidence in uh, Commissioner Lucky uh, for the changes that she's made already within the force and the more changes we need to make quickly uh, to ensure that the uh, women and men who serve in our, uh, uh, in, in our police forces across the country, including the RCMP, can better serve uh, their fellow Canadians, uh, particularly Indigenous and uh, racialized Canadians. Opposition leader Andrew Scheer said the video is very difficult to watch, but when asked if it's evidence of systemic racism, he didn't give a direct answer, instead saying there's a need for dash and body cams. I certainly support uh, measures to, uh, to, to have those types of pieces of equipment installed uh, to ensure that uh, when these incidents happen, we have as much information as possible to determine whether or not officers acted inappropriately and to ensure that, uh, that those who do face, face consequences. The Deputy Prime Minister was also asked to comment directly on the video, but declined, saying the incident is under an independent investigation. That is absolutely essential, and I think that all Canadians will be following that investigation very, very carefully. Uh, our government will certainly be watching it very, very carefully. Initially, RCMP cleared themselves of wrongdoing. But Alberta's police watchdog directed its law enforcement response team to do the investigation. Todd Lamarat, APTN National News, Ottawa. RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky walked back her comments about systemic racism in a statement released late today. During some recent interviews, I shared that I struggled with the definition of, of systemic racism while trying to highlight the great work done by the overwhelming majority of our employees. I did acknowledge that we, like others, have racism in our organization, but I did not say definitively that systemic uh, racism exists in the RCMP. I should have. The commissioner also said the force has not always treated uh, racialized and indigenous people fairly. That video of Chief Alan Adams' encounter with RCMP, of course, has gone viral, with many coming to his defense and calling out what they say is evidence of systemic racism in the RCMP, while others say that he provoked the officers. Joining us now to discuss it is Mi'kmaq lawyer and activist, Pam Palmiter. Pam, thanks for joining us. First, I'm curious, uh, your reaction to that nearly 12-minute RCMP dash cam video? Well, it's sickening to watch, but what this video does is it really speaks to the thousands of experiences that we as Indigenous peoples all across this country have had with the RCMP and other police forces. It's like the video evidence of all of our stories that have been discounted, disbelieved, and most of the time in police brutality situations, it's the Native person that's charged with assaulting an officer or resisting arrest when in fact it was the police officers doing the brutality. Do you think that, we're, that this is happening more often or, you know, the other people are saying it's not happening more often, it's just they're getting filmed more often. I'm curious, what's your, what's your thought? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I have been researching this for two decades now, police violence against Native peoples, especially Indigenous women and girls. And this has been rampant for decades. I mean, look at all the justice inquiries talking about, you know, the, the beatings or the starlight tours or the, you know, killing of unarmed land defenders, all by very relate racist police forces. And the problem is, is that in the past, we didn't have cell phones, mm -hmm. we didn't have social media, there weren't police cams, and so we were always disbelieved. But now, case after case after case is being proven um, that the police officers are literally lying and manufacturing evidence for one of them, each other.
I mean, during this time especially, is it, is it surprising to you that it's continuing? I mean, we've got Black Lives Matter going on. We, you would think that maybe at, of all times, you, we would be seeing less of this sort of thing. You know what? I'm not surprised at all, because one of the things that really stands out is just how deeply ingrained police racism and hatred for Black and Native peoples are, that they're not afraid to continue on with what they've always done. I mean, look at the police brutality in the United States protests. I mean, that's literally what we're protesting against, and they put it on full display, and they don't care that the journalists are there, mm -hmm. they don't care about assaulting journalists, smashing tires, and it's the same thing here. Look at all of the other instances of police brutality just since the coronavirus happened. I mean, the police killings of Native people and the beatings. It continues because they believe they have the right to do it, and no one holds them accountable. What needs to be done to address this issue? Oh, we need to clean house big time. And if we're just talking about the RCMP and, and particular police forces, we need to throw open the books on all police discipline files, investigations, um, reports, inquiries, all of it, and make it public, and then have a zero tolerance policy and get rid of everyone who's a, a racist, who's committed sexualized violence and abuse against Indigenous women and girls, um, excessive use of force, gratuitous violence, and of course, killings of Indigenous peoples. They all got to go. And I think you would see a massive change in just those things. Mm. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us, Pam. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you. Time for us to take another break, but coming up, uh, another question of police use of force, this time in Yellowknife, and a man left with a boot print after he says he was attacked by police on his way home from work. First, here's a look at tomorrow's weather. To the east coast, we've got 22 in sunshine for Fredericton, 19 in cloud for Charlottetown. The Grand River, 13 with some rain, Kujawak, 9 and a little bit of rain. Shabugamu 15 in sunny skies, Quebec City 18 in rain. Ottawa 17 and cloud 17 in sunshine for North Dip, North Bay. So look out 19 and sunny campus casing, lots of sun and 15 degrees. 24 for the Paw and Puckatawagan in sunny skies. Winnipeg 25 with lots of sunshine, same with Dauphin 26 in Brandon. Swift current 32 and cloudy skies, North Battleford is going to be cloudy in 30. Buffalo Narrows, 26, with some rain, 28, and rain for Meadow Lake. Welcome back. The spotlight is on RCMP in the Northwest Territories after allegations of police brutality against an Indigenous man. Benjamin Manuel says he was beaten by a Yellowknife RCMP for no reason whatsoever. Our reporter Charlotte Mort Jacobs has the details. Picked me up and then beat me up and then threw me out over the vehicle like over nothing. Benjamin Manuel is going public about what he says is police brutality in the Northwest Territories. The bruises and swelling on his face make it personal. Manuel claims he was approached by a Yellowknife RCMP constable in the back alley on his walk home from work on June 10th, just a day after an anti-racism demonstration took place. All of a sudden, I just seen RCMP just told me, jump in the back of the truck. So I jumped in the back of the truck, and they told me, oh, Benji, yeah, they're coming with me. So I ended up going with them, and I didn't expect them to do anything to me, this how they're going to give me, talk to me. His girlfriend says she was with him at the time. They ended up just taking him and handcuffed him for no reason. And uh, 20 minutes later, we found him again, and he was standing, laying outside Kim's convenience store, bleeding. Manuel says he was driven a short distance and he claims he was attacked. All I remember was just getting pulled out of the truck, handcuffed, getting kicked in the face. You can still see the footprints on my face. He says he was dropped back off to the alley where he then called his boss. They just left me on the road. They unhandcuffed me and just left me on the road. Unconsciousness. Michael Fatt, who works with Yellowknife's homeless population, 
took his concerns to RCMP today and says Manuel has faced similar police encounters. They seem to think that they have every right in their power just to come and grab you and throw you in a drunk tank and at the same time beat you up a little bit. You know, like I'm not saying that happens all the time or with every officer, but it does happen. The Yellowknife RCMP held a press conference today, separate from the alleged incident, to respond to media inquiries over the anti-racism demonstration held earlier in Yellowknife. But the commanding officer did reply to our questions about Manuel's allegations. Um, so I do know that uh, the Young Knife Detachment has uh, reached out to this gentleman um, and I will let that investigation uh, be gathered. Um, obviously uh, appreciative that uh, uh, it's been brought to our attention and we'll do the follow-up. When asked if Chief Superintendent Jamie Zettler saw racism or racial bias in the NWT RCMP division, he responded with this. There is a uh, individual uh, communities that feel that they are not treated fairly. Um, obviously, um, their experiences are different and, and whatnot than my own. Uh, but again, from my position, uh, I haven't lived those experiences. Charlotte Mark Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. To another video now making the rounds on social media. It shows Winnipeg police arresting a man who had a gun and a knife. Police have received a lot of criticism for this arrest. Today, the force held a press conference to say that the arresting officers had little choice. Daryl Stranger has the details. There's a video that was uh, shared on social media very widely. Um, it, admittedly, it's a tough video to watch. It involves the use of force by our officers. Um, and that video is, shows the arrest of this individual. Constable Jay Murray of the Winnipeg Police Service said the individual being arrested admitted to being on a significant amount of methamphetamine. In the video, you can see Flynn Nolan Dorian, a 33-year-old Winnipeg man, holding what appears to be a handgun. The gun was later determined to be an airsoft gun. The officers struggled to subdue the man who was also wielding a knife. They taser him twice. One officer can be seen kicking the man in the upper body. Constable Murray says that kick was deliberate and justified. A kick likely saved his life. If that individual gets a hold of that knife that's in his waistband, and officers see that and he has that knife in his hand, you're potentially in a lethal force encounter. So as tough as it is to see that kick, that kick helps dislodge that knife and bring that situation down to a point where we can handcuff him safely. Murray added the reason the Winnipeg Police Service released the video and held a press conference so quickly was due in part to not wanting to escalate tensions in the community. If there was no force, or um, an overwhelming, um, I think, demand by the public to have answers for this case that we wouldn't have released this video. We might have held it back for investigative reasons. And there certainly is a risk with releasing this information that it could impact court proceedings. But you have to look at the totality of the situation. We don't want to unnecessarily escalate tensions in the community. I think there's a lot of questions that needed to be answered about this incident, and we made the decision to show the video to try to provide some of those answers. Daryl Stranger, AP10 National News, Winnipeg. A Métis senator is calling for changes to the health care system after Indigenous parents say their daughter was forced into a traumatic examination. The physician denied that, but as APTN reported yesterday, the parents believe systemic racism played a role in what happened. Here's Brittany Hobson. When Senator Yvonne Boyer first heard allegations a physician forced an Indigenous girl to go through a genital examination, she was appalled. It makes me sick. Honestly, that's my reaction. It makes me sick. But unfortunately, Boyer wasn't surprised. The former nurse and lawyer has heard countless stories of Indigenous people facing systemic racism in the healthcare system. These kind of things are very pervasive, and we know that there's, for everyone that comes forward or everyone that's found out, there's probably a hundred behind them. Two years ago, the family brought their then seven-year-old daughter to an emergency room in northeastern Ontario. The parents believed the girl had a urinary tract infection. When they arrived, they say the doctor began asking alarming questions. Following this, they say the doctor then began performing a traumatic genital exam without any consent. The parents believe the family was racially profiled, something the physician denies, saying the exam was medically appropriate. The incident is now before an Ontario Review Board. I mean, there, it, it 
Boyer sat in on a hearing last month to help provide support. She co-authored an external review on the forced sterilizations of Indigenous women at the Royal Roads Hospital in Saskatoon in 2016. Boyer says there are parallels between the two cases. The similarities between these two scenarios of what's happened to this little girl and what's happened to all of those women that are coming forward that have been sterilized, it's the same underpinnings. It's the, it's the unbalance of, I know what's best for you. She added she believes medical violence against Indigenous peoples in Canada is part of a larger history of colonization. It's a whole history of colonization of when this country was settled and the imposition of colonial laws that have put Indigenous people at a distinct disadvantage and the results are in the healthcare system. She said the healthcare system as a whole needs to change. And that doesn't just mean with individual physicians, surgeons, or hospitals. Until we start looking at the structure of why this is happening, you can't keep putting band-aids on it because it, has, it hasn't changed. The band-aids haven't actually been able to get to the root of the problem. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News. Time for another break, but when we come back, the future of Canada's controversial historical statues, and here's the rest of tomorrow's weather. To northern Alberta, we've got 28 rain for Fort McMurray, 18 in rain for Grand Prairie. 27 and cloud for Edmonton, 22 in sunny skies for Calgary. Vancouver and Victoria, 16 degrees and rain, 16 in rain for Cornell, too. Prince Rupert 13 and rain for uh, 21 in Fort Nelson and cloud. Beaver Creek 16 and cloudy skies, 25 and sun for Mayo. 25 and sunny for Norman Wells, 15 and rain for Fort Simpson. 21 and sunny for Colville Lake, 27 in Inuvik. 6 in sunshine for Baker Lake, 6 in cloud for Chesterfield. Arctic Bay mix of sun and cloud in 4 degrees. Pangertongue mix of sun and cloud in 2. Cloud for Clyde River in 2 degrees. Welcome back. After demonstrators in Bristol, England toppled and disposed of a controversial bronze statue over the weekend, conversation has turned to Canada where certain monuments may meet a similar end. The statue of slave trader Edward Colston was ultimately pulled out of the Bristol Harbour where he was dumped. Meanwhile, a petition demanding the removal of John A. Macdonald's statue in Montreal just reached over 10,000 signatures. The monument sits uh, atop a historical mass grave and is often vandalized. Newfoundland and Labrador is promising a review of its provincial statues, one of, in, including one of Portuguese explorer Gaspar Corte Real, who is said to have taken indigenous people as slaves in the early 1500s. That's all the time that we have for your Friday news tonight. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you tomorrow for your APTN News Weekend.